Our, our focus tonight is on Foley sound, and I'd like to introduce uh, Bob Foley, and it's his grandfather that uh, is Mr. Foley, and I didn't know that, and so we're going to turn it over and let Bob share some stories. No one ever called Jack Foley Mr. Foley. <laughs> he was grandpa, you know, and um, I, I have to quote my father who uh, told me before I even had children, he says, you're going to learn someday why grandchildren and grandparents get along so well because they share a common enemy. <laughs> but the truth of it is that Gram Grandpa Foley got along with us kids. I mean, I, first of all, I should tell you, I was born in Hollywood where Grandpa Foley lived, and he would come to visit us when we moved back east, and then we moved up to Northern California. He would come and stay with us for weeks at a time. And he was fun. I mean, he was full of ideas, full of fun ideas. Um, he was doing many things. He was writing constantly. He was painting. And he was still in touch with the people down, um, you know, at, at uh, Universal. So Grandpa Foley was, Jack Foley was born in the 1890s uh, in New York, grew up in Brooklyn, um, and didn't like the climate so much, moved to the west to Bishop, California, on the east of the Sierra Nevada in the, uh, around 1914, where he raised a family and loved the Sierra Nevada. And um, at the time he was writing, uh, he was doing a little bit of acting, and he told the, the people in Hollywood, you really should come up here and look at, uh, at these sites that we have, great locations for westerns. And so he got involved with Universal Pictures. Um, the films at the time were silent films. Um, so he was a, a site scout, basically, but they liked that he was writing and so forth. And in the 20s, uh, when sound started to come in, they said, you know, Jack Foley used to work for the phone company. He probably knows something about sound. <laughs> now, we make jokes about the phone company, thanks to Lily Tomlin, but in those days, <laughs> sound was pretty much a new thing. And uh, so Jack was, uh, Jack, my grandpa was uh, full of great ideas. He would, he would look at these, I mean, really the, the introduction for him with sound was in, in creating footsteps, because footsteps sounded terrible. So he would, he would walk in sync to what was on the film and then record the sound. Pretty soon he had 80 pairs of shoes. And uh, you know, people would say, are you crazy? Well, no, that's what, you know, every, he, then he would say, well, you know, when I walk for Ginger Rogers, I walk for this person or that person, I have to walk differently and then it has to be light on my feet and I get winded if they're, if they're uh, women that I'm walking for. But, um, you know, when we were kids, we would go to Universal, this is in the 50s and uh, early 60s, and meet these people. Now, there were no tours of Universal, you know, it wasn't like Disneyland. It was a movie lot. There was a lot of nothing going on, and when there was something going on, you had to be quiet. But uh, we got to meet these funny people who were Grandpa's friends, like a guy named Jimmy Durante. And a, <laughs> who had this great nose. I mean, just a cha-cha. <laughs> and he, he liked to play with the banana and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, Cary Grant and, uh, and this, this one guy who was a clown, who was like, I, I swear he and Grandpa Foley were uh, brothers from another mother. His name was Walter Brennan. And, he, and you know, I can remember uh, Grandpa telling Walter, you know, you're, you're in Hollywood, man. You're, you're a great character actor. You got this great wolf call. He was had all these great sounds. He said, but you need a gimmick. And Walter's like, what do you mean? And so my grandfather gave him a ball bearing and said, put it in your shoe and walk. Well, there came Grandpappy Amos. And those guys were pals, um, you know, till the day they, they passed away. But. Uh, um, there were many stories that came from, from Grandpa Foley over the years. Uh, you saw some of them on the film, and I'm going to get into a little bit of that if I can operate this phone, which I know I'm not supposed to operate in here. But, but um, um, I when the. For you, okay, do you want to ask now? So, why did they give it the name Foley sound? So, you know, the sound was new. I mean, they were trying to figure out how to make it sound real, but it was, it was new. And Jack Foley had these ideas. And they'd say, well, you know, we got to fix the sound. Yeah, give it to Foley. 
get a, you know, just let's go Foley it. All of a sudden, Foley became not only a guy's last name, it became, you know, a verb, uh, a noun, an adjective, uh, and it took on a life of its own. And it was like, was that just universal? No, uh, all of a sudden they were calling it Foley over at Warner Brothers. And I can remember reading these things, you know, that were written. We've got a, a pile of paper, you know, of, of stories written in the movie lots about this. But all of a sudden it was just foleying. I and mean, we're going to go Foley this, we're going to Foley that. So it was his original idea, and he developed it, but it became a concept. Um, when they were making one of the Frankenstein movies, and they had Boris Kar Karloff all made up, and Mae Clark was the, um, she was acting the part of uh, the fiance of, uh, of Dr. Frankenstein. She shared with my grandfather, you know, when they make up Boris like that, it's actually really freaking me out. <laughs> so he said, talk, talk to Boris. So she said, you know, Boris, when we get to that scene, um, it's, it's actually frightening me. He says, I'm going to move my little finger so you know it's me. Well, when they got to the scene, he didn't move his finger. <laughs> and the freak out was, was priceless. <laughs> But, um, you know, the, the, hanging out with Grandpa, I mean, there, there was, he was always making sounds. I have to acknowledge my wife, Kelly, who puts up with my inability to stop making sounds. I got the gene. I directed it into music, um, and that's a whole, my own set of loose screws. But uh, I know where I got the gene. Now, I want to share a couple of things with you, um, if I can operate this phone. I'm not that good at this. I, you know, Grandpa Foley was all analog. There was none of, this, none of this digital stuff, but um, this is one thing. I'm going to play this for you maybe a couple times to see if you can hear it. You hear that? Can you hear that okay? If you close your eyes, then you let your imagination All right, one more time. Let's play that one more time. I'll try not to erase it. Okay, so who can name that tune? <laughs> Do you know what it is? Jurassic Park. No, you have to understand, Grandpa Foley passed away in 1967, so this was definitely not geriatric park. Did you have a guess? Any guesses? We got a guess back there? No, but that's a good one. It kind of sounds like that sound created with a tool, correct? So what I did today was I actually played a DVD of the movie and recorded it right off our stereo onto this iPhone, which I can sometimes work. Um, who remembers the movie Operation Petticoat? You do? The Pink, the pink Submarine? 1959? So they needed to come up with a sound for this malfunctioning submarine that they couldn't find the right paint for, and it wound up being pink, and there were ladies on board and all this. It was, it was a comedy with Cary Grant and Tony Curtis. They needed to come up with a sound for the diesel engine failing as the boat, you know, because this boat had all kinds of problems, you know, not just, not just sociological, but uh, mechanical as well. That was actually Jack Foley taking a big drink of beer and letting out a burp. And then they slowed it down, and they got that nice gurgle. Now I'll tell you, there was nobody like Grandpa Foley who could teach his grandkids how to burp better. I know, I think it was like Paps Blue Ribbon or maybe Burgermeister, but it didn't matter because we got to eat the foam. And he drank the beer. But they came up with ideas like that. The other one that I want to talk about before I turn the microphone over is that scene in Spartacus, right? You've got the Roman legions, and they, I believe they film that on, on location in Spain, but they, they had like a thousand people, you know, and these guys, the, the puzzle there was, was the, the sound of uh, metal uh, armaments hitting leather armor, and they, they, they couldn't get it. They just couldn't get that sound right, and they were, they were prepared to fly everybody back to Spain to reshoot it, to try to get the sound right. And it was a midnight session, according to Grandpa, and, and they were just, you know, how, what, can we, what can we do? Now, they said in the, in the film here, he went out to his car. He didn't drive. He didn't have a car. He didn't have car keys. But he had these keys. He reached into his pocket and he pulled out this key case. Close your eyes. Not the same keys. 
Yeah. So the timbre might be different, but. Uh. Right? Bobby got the key case. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of great memories. And, you know, and I, I want to uh, acknowledge a couple of other people uh, who aren't here tonight. Uh, my dear friend Jeff Briss, uh, who is a, uh, a sound engineer, uh, pro audio guy, who has been a, a very dear friend of mine since 1980, uh, about four years after I moved here to the Napa Valley to make wine. Um, Jeff and I have been connected through bas basically sound equipment all of that time. And he introduced me to John and Shelley and got us, uh, got us together for a wonderful tour of Skywalker. And, and I was just you know, blown away because you know, as we were growing up with Jack, Jack Foley as a grandfather, he never received a screen credit until the day he died. And Foley art wasn't really ever acknowledged until about the Star Wars time when all of a sudden people's like, how are they doing this? You know, and what's, what's it, what is Foley? What is all this about? Um, in 1979, I, I want to think it was, uh, uh, another friend of mine, uh, Larry, Larry Vermeulen, who was a carpenter, still local here, he said, hey, you know, uh, you've, got, you, you, you've got a recording studio. Let me come show you something we're working on. And I said, okay. So we went over to uh, the Niebaum Coppola estate and went through Zoetrope. And they were mixing a movie called The Outsiders. And I'm looking around, Murdo Laird was director of operations. He gave us the tour and we're, you know, this is all behind the scenes because things are happening and they're actually working and there's a big sound console and these guys are talking to people in New York and it's like, wow, this is real big, big time stuff. And I said to Murdo, hey, you know, is Foley still, uh, still practiced or is that an antiquated term? And he goes, oh Christ, we have like, you know, six hours of Foley and three hours of do it. And I, and I said, well, Jack Foley was my grandfather. Everybody in the place stopped. The jaws dropped. They turned and looked. And I was like, oh, what did I do? <laughs> what did I do wrong? Anyway, so I wanted to acknowledge uh, Larry for that introduction. That was very cool. So anyway, I'm going to turn this over to some real Foley artists here, unless you have something. Yeah, please. <laughs> no, you do. You are great. I love it. You've got stories after stories, which is great. So, yeah, that's the Holy Grail. Yeah, the Holy Grail. Um, so let's talk a bit, little bit, Shelley and John, share a little bit about how you got started, and um, uh, and then you've got some demos. So I don't know when you want to do those. So let's let you go. I'm gonna. Sh I'm going to share the mic with John, my partner, because like the movie said, it's all about who you work with, and I love my partner, John, dearly. Feelings mutual. Um, and I'm not sure if it was captured, um, the idea that John and I are part of a legacy that was started by your grandfather, Jack, mm -hmm. and how many Foley artists are there in the world? Now, uh, there's actually a page on Facebook, and I would say at, at the page, we're just hitting 4,000 people that say they're either associated with or Foley artists across the entire globe. Yes, but there are more. Uh, there are more astronauts <laughs> in the world than, than are working professional Foley artists. They're just undiagnosed. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not going to let go of this because I feel, I feel the vibe. It's, it's great. Right. Um, so, gee, what do, we, what do we start with? How do you get started? Oh, you go first? <laughs> Me first. Okay. Yeah, you go first. Right. And then... A real quick thank you, by the way, for everybody staying late, yeah, and also to our wonderful host here, and of course, the man. Uh, it was an incredible thrill to know that, wait a second, Jack Foley has somebody that we can actually talk to and I can touch? So, John, can yeah. I get you to put the tail out? Yes, putting the tail out. We're sounding better now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and um, I wanted to be an actor, and I was in high school, and then I went to NYU Film School, uh, thinking, well, you know, directing's going to be better. And then I went to AFI as a directing fellow, and all of a sudden, I didn't love it. So because I didn't love it, I thought, well, i got to do something else. And just coincidentally, a woman who was my script supervisor said, look, um, can you help out? We're doing sound on a film. Okay, I can help, but I've never done sound. So. so I show up, and I'm helping out with, if you saw them, you know, like Kay Rose, you know, she's had what are called rewinds, and there's literal film. Anyway, I was doing all that stuff. And they looked around and said, we have to do Foley today. Okay, I don't know what that is, except maybe somebody you find in a hospital. And um, uh, you had to put that one in. Didn't you? I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, <laughs> right. uh, there are a couple other assistants beside myself, and so they look around and they go, they, "You have tennis shoes, don't you?" I say, "Yeah." Are you a runner? Oh yeah, I'm a runner. Good. Come with us. 
go into the Foley stage and look at that screen. Okay, I see that. And see that guy running? Uh, run for him, please. Okay, so I ran from here all the way over to the back. And no, 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 you have to do it in front of a microphone. <laughs> oh. So I kind of had a knack for it, I guess, and uh, just by the people upstairs, so to speak, uh, that was 42 years ago. <laughs> and um, I've been lucky enough to work in many films. And uh, with what Shelley said, too, is, uh, uh, family, both business and personal, is most important. And that's one of the greatest things I love about this film. And, um, and I say this, hopefully you understand the way I'm saying this, a lot, a lot of people I saw on screen, we saw on screen, I know them personally. They're wonderful people. Mm -hmm. What Ben Burtt said is true. Family's everything. He made sure during Star Wars, all that craziness, six o'clock, go home, have dinner with your family. I think that's wonderful. And. Um, and so, just to pass over to Shelley, I um, want to say that uh, Jack was, we got just like one one millionth of what he was. He was a true renaissance man, director, assistant director, writer, uh, script supervisor, um, location scout. Um, I, I just, I mean, it's amazing what that guy did. And uh, I just, the only regret I have in life, so to speak, uh, would be that I didn't meet him. But certainly I have in a way with the magic that we are able to hopefully make uh, that will mm -hmm. have you with me sitting in the audience having popcorn going, this is great, just we're in involved in this drama of the story. So with that, that I'll turn it over to Shelley. Before I start my life story, which is 20 years I will talk about, um, I think we try to help the spirit of Jack Foley live on through our work every day in the innovative approaches that we take and in the fun and the play that we bring to every day and the discovery through mistakes, through making mistakes. Um, we like to push the art form. It's just um, every single day is different. And just to clarify too what Foley is, which you saw in the movie, there's field recording out in the field and then there is sound effects where people are sitting in front of the computers now or with MAG before 1999, um, cutting sound effects from a library that maybe they recorded in the field. And then there are Foley studios, they're called Foley stages, where John and I work. And we actually watch the film as you saw John and his partner Allison in, at Warner Brothers do. Um, and we're in sync, we're running, it looks hilarious. Um, <laughs> and so I, as a child would also take a cassette tape recorder <laughs> um, and record commercials and play them over my favorite cartoons, Tom and Jerry. Um, and my mother was in a barbershop quartet, so I developed a good ear for four-part harmony. Um, so I went to college for film. I thought I was going to be an animator. And I ended up going to Los Angeles for an internship program. And during the internship program, a sound supervisor who was featured in the movie said, hey, why don't you call John Rush and go visit the Foley stage? So I called John Rush and eventually we ended up getting together for lunch and we've developed a friendship for 20, that we've had for 20 years and I did not know I was going to become his partner and move up to Skywalker Sound. I'm so beyond delighted to carry on the legacy of your grandfather's generation, your generation, and now moving forward. Um, and I just got, in Los Angeles, I got a, I had an opportunity to work on student films for free after my internship, and I took it and tried on the Foley stage, um, the Foley stage, the Foley artists who worked there at the time were two gentlemen, and they had giant shoes, and I actually borrowed their shoes and walked and tried to figure out what I was doing. And then a friend from school, from Ithaca College, uh, hired me on my first paid gig at a small sound studio and I worked my way up um, and eventually ended up at Warner Brothers where I met John and so luck luckily we got the opportunity, John got the opportunity to move up here and brought me along. So that's, that's it. <laughs> okay. Very cool. So you guys uh, wanted to do a little demo. By the way, have you seen Red Like the Sky? The I Italian so. film about the uh, the most famous sound editor in Italian film. Wow! Really wow. incredible film okay. about 
sound, not Foley, but mm -hmm. sound in movies. So mm -hmm. it, it, the cassettes man, remind me. So you brought some things that you want to share today. So <laughs> yeah. let's let's do a little demo. Do you need the microphone? Uh, I think I think uh, I like maybe chair, yes. By the way. I like the sound of your chair. Oh, very very nice. Oh. <laughs> do yes. you ever run out of sound? I hope not. Uh, we we try not to. Okay. Um, just real quick, um, I'm going to show you. These, of course, would, one would use for a motorcycle, but if you look carefully, it's hard to see, but they have little like paper clip like things on the end. So we would take these, put these on, and use these for dog feet, you know, a little chick, 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 so to speak. And then, of course, what helps sell a dog, too, is to have a dog collar. Now, mostly when you... When you Here, I'll hold. Okay. So, oh, thank you. Mostly when you, <laughs> when you uh, watch a film that has a dog in it, unless it's, you know, something outside or trying to get back somewhere, anyway will put a dog collar in whether you see it actually around the neck or not. Because that's one way where you associate with that's a dog. So we use those tricks, if you will, to help fool the audience, to hopefully to believe what you see. Because again, it's all, you know, if we pull back from the frame, you know, it's all fake. So we wanted to make sure it's real. And in that, I brought a couple other things from way back in the day. Uh, how many people saw the film Hook? Okay. Tinkerbell. That is Tinkerbell from the film Hook. Oh. And uh, we had about 10 of these, so each one had a particular emotion we assigned to it. So this one, let's see. She's happy. Let's see. That's right. <laughs> this one, she's excited. And then the other ones, I lost. So. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right. And I'll grab it. Thanks. Uh, real quick, too, with E.T., the extraterrestrial, which you saw that uh, clip. Um, that was a picture which Steven Spielberg was very worried about whether the kids are they going to dive under the seats first time you see E.T. because it's in the cornfield and he's screaming, ah, ah, the whole thing. <laughs> and truly, they were very worried. And so they said to Chuck Campbell, who was the supervisor of sound editor in that picture, uh, make him sound funny. Well, E.T. itself was this uh, small person, if you will, in a suit that about that high, a rubber suit, that squeaked like no tomorrow. Or it was uh, something Carlo Rambaldi had created, which was uh, literally from the waist up, which had a series of valves and uh, steam and all sorts of things like whoosh, whoosh, which would make him move. Of course, you couldn't use, couldn't use any of that. What, how, are we, how are we gonna make this thing sound funny? So went out to lunch that day uh, with my partner uh, at that time, Joan Rowe, and she ordered Jello. So it got thrown down on the tray and, and she and I looked at it and we started laughing. <laughs> she goes home and creates a huge pot of jello, brings it in the following day. I take my t one of my t shirts, I turn it upside down, I tape off the neck and the arms, and then we dump the jello in. I grab it by the waist then, so I've got this kind of big jello sack on <laughs> in front of the microphone anytime E.T. walked. <laughs> and then, of course, when E.T.'s walking, he reminded me of a duck out of water, so I use my hands to try to sound like, oh, he's you know, not quite able to walk correctly. Anyway, so of course, uh, I think it's still number three of all time, that picture. And last but not least, and I'll just give you one word to hold that for a second. Sure. Within that picture, uh, we saw uh, E.T.'s uh, finger talking to Elliot there at the end, if you will. So it's hard to hear here, actually, but oh, yeah. this is um, E.T.'s finger, which healed him early on in the picture, and then we saw it at the end. And yes, this is just a tuning fork that would, oh, you know, get a little neat reaction. So, so can I help you, any of you holding the mic for yours? Okay. Sure, sure. Okay. Okay, so the best part of, I think the most confusing and fun part of our job is we use everyday objects to create sounds um, that aren't what you see. Um, for example, John was referring to Jell-O. Um, one morning I was eating oatmeal and egg whites together and with honey, I mean, Gross, but um, <laughs> but it made a really gory sound, and I was working on a lot of horror movies early on in my career, so I, I used that a lot in my recipes. And also, lasagna and celery sound great for broken bones, by the way. So, um, so to use something that you have in your everyday life, um, let me just show you. So this is pretty familiar, right? You you probably all know what this is. In your car, you, you put it up to protect it from the sun. It's all tangled, so one moment, please. Um, so when John and I were working on The Incredibles 2, we had to come up with the sound of um, Mrs. Incredible. That's her name, right? Mrs. Incredible's parachute. 
just an accent because sound has gotten so loud in movies. So we really have to punch through it sometimes. So um, I was just playing with this one day and thought, OK, maybe. OK, there's the accent that we need when her parachute opens up. That's it. So there's, there's that. Sure, sure. <laughs> Can you mic me? So, and in front of the microphone, it's much bigger. <laughs> um, and then for the elastic stretches of her arms, we would augment it with this guy. And uh, I found this latex mask at a Halloween store, but he's very reliable for anything from her arm stretches. Let's see, let me put it on the ground, actually. So, it, it reliably gives me the friction I need for things that are stuck or things that need tension or just emotional moments. So I try to think of sounds as emotional moments. Um, and lastly, uh, for, <laughs> thanks, I got it now, <laughs> thank you. Um, for Black Panther that we worked on together, um, we had to create the sound of vibranium, which is a metal found in Wakanda. So what does vibranium sound like? Um, it has to sound pretty special, like not tinny or any, any wimpy metal. Um, so John and I went to Petaluma, and we went to this store called Micellis. It's my, yeah, and uh, it has a, like acreage, it has seven acres of, of surplus, whatever. You can find anything there. So um, we were rooting around, the three of us, because there actually is a team of three um, at Skywalker. Our mixer who records us, or else you won't be able to hear us, his name's Scott Curtis, he couldn't come tonight. So we were all rooting around, and I came across this weird looking crowbar. Um, Why don't you take that? Problem? So I wish I could hit the stage to really do it, but can I? It's wood? Okay, that's good. So. Hold on a second. Let me actually hit it on something else. Because the wood's not going to do it. It's going to be hot. So you hear it. That's the crowbar by itself. And then we added this really weird gothic looking candle holder <laughs> to our collection, which was handed down by another wonderful Foley artist from MGM days. Um, and this makes a shing sound. Let me just put this down. <coughs> shing. Like here, I'll put my ring against, against it. So there's that. So we try to make the sounds complex. So I, I like to use multiple tools to create different um, like pitches. So together, they sound like this. So the Wakanda uh, spears, as they were welcoming him back, as you saw, it was just like, bam. Um, and that was a moment that sung through. So that's all we have. That's all we have to share. You guys are right there. Wow. So you're working in both animated and not animated movies. And the director and you have so many sounds so that when, when you're seeing a new movie, like the next generation, how do you, what goes through your head and do they, the, the directors give you direction on what they want a sound to feel like? I think I want you to answer that. Okay, so the director hires a sound supervisor, which you saw in the movie, Ben Burt. Um, Richard Anderson, Karen Baker Landers. And that person is responsible for the entire palette of sound, Foley ADR dialogue, everything you saw. And then they hire a Foley supervisor that is the conductor and says, okay, we need something here, 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 and footsteps for this character from here to here. And they hand us a roadmap, which I love that word that you like to call it. And John and I will start our day in the morning by going, okay, cool, we have footsteps for Black Panther, we have footsteps for this character, um, who do you want to be? And we audition shoes, and then we go through and, and do all those characters. And then we do the props, we uh, decide what we feel like doing, and like John loves to do certain things, I love to do certain things, and um, I am making a very long answer of this, but I just want to educate. <laughs> um, so, so just to let you know, um, from the director, those, choices, those emotional choices um, and creative choices come through the sound supervisor and then to us. So, um, but sometimes they're on, on the smaller films, the director likes to be a part of the Foley and that happened to me for Ryan Johnson's first movie. Um, Ryan Johnson directed The Last Jedi and he did Knives Out, which is wonderful. 
Yeah, and so he came on the stage when I was doing footsteps for his movie Brick, and that was just fun. It's just young, fun directors um, just being innovative with sound. So, yeah. Do you have anything to add? Um, no, I think you said okay. it all. That was great. That's just just so. Why don't we put you back in your yeah. chair? We're going to open it up to the audience for some questions um, because it's now that, now sound is so important. So. That was pretty good. Where'd that come from? <laughs> yeah. All right. Do we have any questions in the audience tonight? Hi, I have a question. Thank you. You guys are, you guys are awesome. Um, when you audition a sound, do you audition it live or do you record it and then audition it, record it? Right, right. Do we audition live or, or record it? Well, this is gonna, you're going to hate this answer. We do both. Uh, I tend to be very, uh, I need to do it once, perform it, to see how it's going to work. Other people, <clears throat> excuse me, aren't quite that way. They can have in their minds per se to know what they're going to do and do that and it works. Mm -hmm. But it's, because for, for me it's kind of a combination of tactile and, and audio, you know, and like, so I see, okay, there's a door squeak open. So I think I've got this chair that's going to work. Uh, I wasn't quite, didn't quite give the dramatics I needed, so I'll try something else. <coughs> Excuse me, and of course, as Shelley said, Scott is an incredible uh, addition to the team because you know uh, it all goes to him, and then he helps you know move it ahead in whatever way is necessary. Maybe he might be able to raise a little bit, lower a little bit, you know, pitch whatever. So, and and he also comes from an editorial background, which is not what used to be. It used to be a foley mixer was a foley mixer was a foley mixer, but he comes from the editorial side also, so he can actually help with those tricks. If you, if you will, to, to again, <clears throat> make hopefully with something which is good. I just have one more thing to add. And <coughs> yes, we audition and we have something in our brains, what might work, and then we record it and play it back with everything. So we have the sound effects and the music and the dialogue and how does it fit into context and does it help the story or does it hurt it? Okay, maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I'll be a little more subtle. So we go from there. So you take all that work and then ultimately you present it, I presume, to the director. Just as a wild number, what percentage of your work would be rejected versus accepted by a director? <laughs> okay, that's an interesting question. Um, the sound supervisor is the one who would reject it. Um, and usually we work at Skywalker with people who share similar instincts as us, like uh, right now we're working on an animated film for Pixar and we're with a team where they trust us completely and then they'll play back a whole reel and say, nailed it, or maybe you want to sweeten this, or actually we'd like this to sound a little more hollow. So they guide us along the way. Um, but rejected means we might not get played ever. So we'll do the entire soundtrack for Foley, all feet, all props. But do they play it in the mix at the end? It might never get played, never again. So we just release it, let go, and say, I did a great job. That's all that matters. Absolutely right. And, and yeah. in conjunction with that, too, uh, the difference between live action and animation. In animation, they're going to play a lot more of the foley. Because again, there's no original sound. So uh, now, that being said, if it's uh, something you know, which has a lot of music in it, or even singing in it, that might you know, override. Because you know, we want to hear the people sing. But, um, but that's really true, I think, you know, in a way. And of course, I've worked on films where they played maybe 95% of the Foley, which is unbelievable. And I've worked on other like films. Let me think about that, actually. And then other ones where we, we go, okay, I heard his footstep in Reel 3. Yes. You know, but ultimately it doesn't really matter for, for me, if, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, my ego's not involved in it per se, because just I know exactly. what it is that we have done as a team, presented the best possible, mm -hmm. um, job that we can and just let and just let it go from there be, almost be like being a musician in a sense in an orchestra you know it's the conductor's going to decide what's going to happen so to speak and then the recording engineer will too so what are some of the uh, easier effects and some of the harder effects okay ah I can't share that because we're working on it I'll think about it. I'll think about it. Um. <laughs> while, while Shelley's thinking about it, uh, typically uh, people that are younger people want to get into Foley, they think the easiest thing to do are footsteps because in a sense when you get sync, 
that is you can walk in rhythm with what you're seeing on screen. When you've done that, you think, ah, I've made it. Ironically, that's actually the hardest thing to do. Because imagine a character, let's say uh, an attorney, a guy getting up from behind a desk and walking up to the uh, defendant, you know, and then the prosecuting attorney will do the same thing. You want to give it a different emotional value to each of those feet, in the shoes, in the performance, in the amount of scuff, in the amount of sound, in the amount of is it is he lower, bigger, because this is somebody that's going to hurt this person. I mean, there's all these um, emotional tags you're trying to put into it. So footsteps, by far, are the hardest thing to do correctly. I'd like to add to that. So with a good example of that would be if you go see the movie Onward, listen to Dad's footsteps. And that's what, that's what we're talking about. What is the the most the most used tool you use mostly? Oh, good question. Well, I use every part of my body. I use my hands, like if I'm grabbing onto something, or I, if, I, if someone's body is falling on the ground, I will pretend that my body is falling by using a piece of leather and a boxing glove to make it sound like a body, because I don't want to hurt myself. And then it's a very, very physical job. Like, if you do any sports, like do you run or play soccer or anything like that, um, football or just run around and play, it's, it's a lot like that. But you're in sand pit, you're in dirt pit, you're in, you're in the water. I mean, it's very playful. And so I would have to say our, our bodies we use it because, we, yeah. Anything, anything to add? To I, that? I agree, and, and the subset to that, the second most thing are the shoes, because I probably have, I don't know, sixty pairs of shoes. I think Shelley has what hundred something. Probably. And yes, I do have <laughs> two pairs of high heel. <laughs> yes, <he does. coughs> and uh, Judy, my wife, was here tonight, whom I love dearly. Uh, she took me to because I couldn't go by myself to get these new set of high heels, which I needed for this film, where they really wanted them to sound really just like you know, those are high heels. So I sit down and I'm putting on size 13 women's high heels. <coughs> and uh, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed looking around. And all of a sudden this guy plops down next to me, opens up a box top, he puts on a pair of shoes. And I think to myself, this guy's not a Foley artist. So, but I didn't say any more than that. I just kind of quickly grabbed my shoes and she, Judy and I uh, <laughs> got out of there. But uh, anyway. Did you ever find yep. out? I'm sorry? Did you ever find out what he Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. <laughs> oh boy. And, and we don't ask about it. Do you get to? Do they only walk backward models? But um, do your high heels only walk backwards. Never mind. Um, <laughs> the, the, question, the, the question I had was sort of the gentleman over here. How, if at all, has the has the Foley business evolved from original to recorded to electronic? Uh, and, and how is that? How is that moved? Okay, all right. I'll, I'll start. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> okay, well, the question would be like, what did Foley start with with Jack? By the way, it's an acetate disc originally. That's where the recording medium. And where is it today? Of course, today it's computers. Well, what happened in the meantime? <clears throat> you had optical, which was kind of its own little domain, and during that time, optical, and then into what's called mag. Mag was, if we notice again, the rewinding that th look, look, 35 millimeter film, which it truly was. Um, those are analog days, and the big uh, studios like Universal, Paramount, etc., had their own stages and their own crews. So it was not unlike what Ben was saying about uh, each individual uh, sound effect library from Warner Brothers versus MGM. Each, as far as there was a sound specific, if you will. So Foley wise, there was kind of just this generality that was covered. You'd do some footsteps, you'd do maybe some keys, you'd do this, that, and the other, but you really wouldn't branch out much further than that. And then, of course, Star Wars hit, and that was just before computers. So all of a sudden, you're having this experimentation of like, well, how can we, you know, make this what we see on the screen? What can we do for that? Mm -hmm. And um, so that opened up a whole um, subset of Foley stages that were independent of the studios because the studios are kind of somewhat stuck in our ways, quote unquote, not trying to put them down, it's just the way it was. 
I was fortunate enough to work at a place that, um, you know, I mean, I didn't know anything. I was just this young Foley guy, and so sure, body fall. Let me. I took judo. Let me go. Um, you know, you need to. Uh, <coughs> thank you. Uh, you need um, uh, uh, footsteps of a horse that's uh, slow motion. It has to be big because it's being shot in this film called The Long Riders. Uh, so we took this, uh, what you see today, in um, uh, for the, uh, like reporters, you know, on tonight's the news. They'll have a little ECM 50, not unlike what this microphone is. In fact, I have two of them. And so I took one of those and I stuck it on the bottom of a cowboy boot between the heel and the toe. It's uh, kind of right there. And because it was so small and what I was doing was so big, it had this huge sound that we could slow down. And mind you, this was not my idea per se. That was the mixer back then, Tim Sadler. So, see, that's why family is important because I don't have all the answers. In fact, I'm not going to have any. Uh, but I have Shelly. So, uh, so, so, from there then, there was this experimentation. And then, of course, when computers hit, then it really opened it up even more. So today, just today, let's say we did something for a film we worked on where Scott, the mixer, could actually take it. He, in a sense, slowed it down a little bit, made it bigger, lower, gave it some boom. Things that we really couldn't do per se on the stage, and yet it was perfect. Yeah. Um, I think the process has changed because when there was one track of sound, we had the sound designer slash editor be the Foley artist. Um, but now there's so many tracks, it's endless. So there have to be people who specialize in things, which is lucky for us, so we can be Foley artists for our lives. Um, so the, the process has changed also in the way that things are used. In radio, footsteps were created when, with people using the shoes on, on their hands. And you can hear how hollow that sounds because no one's in them. So we put our feet in the shoes and we actually dance around and, and um, make Thor or the Hulk come to life. Um, and some things haven't changed, like plungers. We still use plungers for horse feet. They sound great. So <laughs> why change it? Um, the biggest thing that's changed, though, is we have to create sounds for things that they can create from computer graphics. So we're innovating like you've never, like I've never innovated before. So I started in the early, <laughs> I guess 1999 is when I started. And things have come so along so fast um, to where we have to always push ourselves beyond what we know, which is exciting. And why not live life that way? It's the best. So any other questions? Hi, uh, thanks for being here. This is a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm. I have a couple quick questions. One uh, about the um, sound in space. We have all these space movies, but without atmosphere, honestly, uh, my understanding is there wouldn't be sound, all these explosions, explosions, mm -hmm. so on, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, I really appreciated how the movie emphasized the role of sound in putting together a story that really is emotional. You get you get hooked into it, and um, so I, I love it when everything works seamlessly in a movie telling that story. Um, I saw a movie recently where the um, there were two or three scenes where the, the main character was smoking a cigarette, and it was really loud, and it took oh, me yeah. out of the movie and made me realize I'm watching a movie, and so. Two-part question. One, how would you do a cigarette inhalation? Because it wasn't really like that. It was almost like, I don't know, it's crackling, like almost like a fire. <laughs> and number two, could that have either A, just passed all the, the supervisors and the final director in that and just been, been missed? Or could there have been an intention in making that overly loud that there was something that the director was trying to get? I want to address the first part of your question, then I'll pass the mic. Um, you never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Um, Grandpa Foley would pull out like a t-shirt and he'd flap it past you and he goes, yeah, we use that to make the sound of the bat in Dracula. Bat wings don't make any sound. But it made that bat come to life, right? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, good answer. Um, in a 
of the cigarette. Do you want to answer that question? Sure. Crack, well, first I'm going to say is next time, uh, look at your favorite film, if you take your favorite scene, and watch it. Then go okay. back, watch again, turn the sound off. And crackling cigarette, actually we take cigarettes that have not been lit and take them right in front of the mic and just roll them in our hands slowly. Or. Or, right. Or you can use a clove cigarette and light it up, but we have sprinklers in our Foley stage and we don't do that anymore. <laughs> so that's why some methods are changing. And maybe it was a conscious decision or maybe they had a not a budget and they had uh, somebody who attempted to do it that didn't know what they were doing, which is great. So why not learn that way and then listen back to it and be like, oh, maybe we created a dramatic moment with that cigarette. So. Well, I, I, yeah, the, um, I know I must be missing something basic here, but when it sounds like all these things that you guys do are done after the movie's been shot. So are you saying that the actors don't hear any of this, these sounds? They're acting without any, any sound other than their mouths? Correct. <laughs> okay, so the microphone that you're holding right now is yeah. recording your dialogue, but it, the person next to you just touched his hand to his shirt, and I didn't hear that. But you might have heard it. No. But, but I guess, <laughs> I'm, but I, guess I, I don't understand Bad. how how they can be so realistic in their acting without hearing all this stuff okay. that's going to be in the movie that's on the screen. They're better oh. than we thought they were. So it just sounded just very surprising, actually, to me. Right. I mean, you saw Batman with the microphone in his face with that big light behind him, right? Those are good actors that can just be in the moment like that. Please. And Shelly just said it, be in the moment, because don't forget, actors want, are doing it, they're, they're working with the other actor. So that's where they are, their focus is. So the director is moving the sto storyline along along the, with the cinematographer. So the, the effects, sound effects, et cetera, all that you've seen tonight, again, that's not an afterthought, but that's not something an actor is gonna really think about. They're thinking about what is my emotion in the scene, and how do I hit that note? Yeah. Good answer. It's not so much a question, but it brings to mind Monty Python and the Holy Grail, <laughs> and they were doing Foley. Coconuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We joke around like that with coconuts sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, say you, or you get hired for a job, are you only left with your, are you, do you only have your tools and that's it, or is every... Uh, job like they ha it has to be specific like do you own your own sounds or like can you reuse your own sounds I'll yeah. start but yeah, I'll, I'll it. okay um, fully by definition are custom sound effects so uh, yes we reuse the shoes from this show A to B to C but the way we're utilizing the shoes are different and uh, we have those shoes with us at all times but if there's a, a film coming up, we know like, hmm, that we don't really have anything for that. We'll go out and get it. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll add that to our repertoire. Right. So, um, yes, and so now. A good, a good example of that is Dunkirk. The director requested from the sound supervisor that the boots that the soldiers were wearing have hobnails in them. So John and I created them in our each individual ways and managed to make that sound because we got that guidance. Right. Trademark the sounds? Oh, no. Uh, short answer is no. <laughs> no. Um, and what Shelley just mentioned about that was uh, at Dunkirk, where there's a, what's called the British Expeditionary Force, were caught mm -hmm. and they needed to get off and go across back, back across the channel. We had done the scene without hobnails, and it came down. Um, where are the hobnails? But not so. Not that we messed up. But it's just that we actually added that. Because that brings up a good point, too, in that if we have the hobnails, what we call married, that is literally doing it, having them on the bottom of our shoes, doing it at the same time, that's the sound you're going to get. Versus if we just have non hobnail boots and then have another set of boots on another channel, that can be mixed together. Now, it's not what we did for Dunkirk, but that is something that's important that we can do sometimes. Thank you for telling us that Shelly has over 100 pairs of shoes. My husband will be happy to hear that. <laughs>
<laughs> I don't even come close. But locally, uh, Rianda House did a little production of A Christmas Carol in December, and I was the sound effects person. Oh, so can you please give me a cheap and quick and dirty down, easy way to make wind sounds? Huh, yes. Yes, well, go, Michelle's gonna go, go first. Go ahead. Okay, get yourself a cushion off of a chair. Make sure the cushion has cloth on it. Hopefully it has some texture. And take a piece of canvas tarp and just rub it on there. Zzz, zzz. Get so, the mic very close. Yeah, get the mic very close. Like, yeah. Within that. And what would your quick and dirty? That was it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Be loud. <laughs> oh, no. Hi, this is great. I love what you're doing. But when you go to a movie just for fun, do you really enjoy the movie or are you always listening for just the sound effects? I enjoy the movie 100%, especially because I watch a lot of old movies that don't have quite the <laughs> sound that we're used to hearing in theaters these days. So that's the way I enjoy my free time, is watching those quieter movies. Um, and if I see a modern film that is excellent, I will be 100% immersed in it. If I don't like the film, I will listen to the Foley. That's exactly what I do. If I, if I love the picture, I'm caught up in, in it, like just you know putting the popcorn, oh, what's gonna happen next? Where if I don't like the picture, I go, I hate this Foley. <laughs> Unless we did, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, truly, you know, that's just it. Because I'm, we're audience people too. You know, we want to be entertained. We want mm -hmm. to have be taken to the heights or dropped to the depths or whatever's mm -hmm. happening in the scene. Mm -hmm. And it's just a joy for me to be in this business, um, to have helped participate in an incredibly small way uh, with the nicest people on the planet. I'm telling you, it's that it makes all the difference, and uh, I'm very grateful for that. I get the first and last questions, cool. So I, I love the magic of movie making and I think there's nothing more magical than Foley. So my question is when you go to the movies and you listen, can you go, that's Larry doing the Foley, I know that. I feel like I've studied enough of my fellow Foley artists work that I can identify who does what, yes. And sometimes I can understand what they're using. <laughs> yes. Same thing. Awesome. Yeah. I think tonight you got an introduction to um, what goes on behind the scenes of the movie. What makes a movie is the sound. I used to think it was the visual, and um, I've been. I'm a believer in the sound makes it or breaks it, along with the editor. So I really want to thank um, Bob for you. Or yeah, Bob for you showing and telling the stories of your grandpa, which. Yeah. I just thought it was a term. So the fact that it's a real person that brought this to the industry, and, and for Shelly and John, for you guys to give up your time, and for, honestly, for Skywalker to say yes, to have him here, that we could have him on our stage. So thank you. I have a few people I'd like to acknowledge. Kathy, for hosting this event. John and Shelly for making the drive all the way up here. Someone else who's not here tonight, my uh, first cousin, Kathy Clark, yes. who lives down in Southern California, who has been the single most instrumental person in our family to really compile all of the information of the, the life and the art of Jack Foley, and has been in touch with John over the years. And unfortunately, she's not, she's not here tonight, but she definitely is in spirit. And finally, I would like to acknowledge all of you for staying here. Th yes. And your interest in sound, I mean, I, you know, I stayed out of the sound industry as a vocation. I'm a winemaker, but I hear my way through life. You know, go outside and listen to the world like you've never listened to it before. And if, you've, if you're as crazy as the three of us are, you walk past the squeaking gate, gate and go, I got to collect that sound. <laughs> you, you'll step on an acorn and go, wow. That was the sound of somebody's nose being broken. And you will never be able to, to look at a ham again when you understand that the best punch is when you punch a ham and that gets recorded. <laughs> no one makes fight scenes like Americans and it's always the ham. 
with that, thank you, everyone.